So what most people take away from the wealth of nations is a notion that um, self-interest is going to, you know, lead to social good, but really, you know, maybe a kind of almost greed is going to, you know, drive society. Do you read the wealth of nations that way, or do you think that's an over uh, or mischaracterization? I think it's uh, one of those partial truths that uh, disguises uh, a larger set of more important truths. It's true that uh, the, the principle that the uh, motivation behind economic activity that Smith deals with in The Wealth of Nations is what he calls self-interest or self-love, by the way. By calling it self-interest, he was taking a traditional set of, of negative characterizations of what was usually known as greed or avarice and giving it a more uh, neutral uh, definition. And a lot of the book is, is, not necess is it's not about how the pursuit of self-interest necessarily leads to positive public outcomes. It's about how it can lead to positive public outcomes if economic institutions and political institutions are structured the right way. And I think actually that's a topic of, of ongoing interest. Uh, in what ways can self-interest promote the general interest? Uh, and what sort of institutional mechanisms do we need to try to make sure that's the case? But what I think a lot of people miss in The Wealth of Nations, because they don't read far enough, is Smith was explaining how in his day certain market institutions could, and to some degree were providing for universal benevolence in the sense of making more goods available to the mass of the population, but that some of the ways in which uh, workers and businessmen, and especially merchants, uh, organize themselves for political reasons were leading them to circumvent the political, mar the competitive market in a way that actually wasn't in the public interest. Mm -hmm. And that's a kind of dynamic that remains intrinsic to representative capitalist societies too. So how is Adam Smith relevant today? One of the ways in which Smith is relevant is his concern for universal opulence, his concern for how to bring uh, economic well-being to as much of the population as possible. Uh, and, and his sense that that's actually one of the key questions, not just for economists, but for moral thinkers and for political thinkers too that raising the standard of living of a population in an ongoing way is actually one of the most moral and political issues that one can raise. So that's the first way. Mm -hmm. uh, another way is in showing to people something that actually a lot of people still don't recognize. That is the, the fact that self-interest can actually lead to public benefits uh, through a competitive market and innovation and greater productivity and so on. Uh, it's easy for us to say that, but it's remarkable how many intellectuals still don't get the idea. Mm -hmm. Another way in which he's relevant is that he's interested in the many ramifications of uh, a market economy uh, and how uh, everything from family structures to uh, issues of defense and issues of international relations are related to a capitalist economy. Mm -hmm. And uh, so one of, the, and one of the things that's striking about Smith is that he's not a one-sided ideological devotee of any particular position. He's exploring things in a, in a multifaceted way and he's open to both the, possibility, the positive possibilities of a market economy and some of the negative developments that it might bring about. And he's always asking himself, what can we do to increase the positive possibilities? And what can we do to mitigate some of the uh, inevitable negative effects? Mm -hmm. And in that sense, I, I think he's still an exemplary thinker. Mm -hmm. What were one or two of the negative aspects of capitalism that Smith pointed to? Well, early on in The Wealth of Nations, in one of its most famous passages, he deals with why capitalism can be so much more productive uh, under current circumstances. And in the 18th century, a lot of that had to do with the division of labor. Uh, rather than having some artisan make a whole object himself, it was broken up into various parts, into what we would now call an assembly line. 
the yeah. Smith's point was that actually this kind of division of labor went on throughout society. And so the first part of the Wealth of Nations is about how that division of labor can lead to greater productivity in a way that makes it possible to make uh, less and less expensive commodities that are available to more and more people, which is part of the point of the Wealth of Nations. But then, in the later parts of the Wealth of Nations, Smith deals with some of the negative effects of that process. So for that fellow who's on the assembly line in the pin factory, who spends all day doing one narrow, specialized task, what are the psychological and mental effects of that? That's what Smith asks, and he says, mm -hmm how our minds work depends a lot on the kind of work that we do. And if we're doing this kind of negative, uh, this kind of repetitive, mind-numbing work all day, it's going to dull our mental faculties and make it difficult for us to think about larger questions in the world, larger cultural questions, larger political questions, mm -hmm. and what have you. And so in the later part of The Wealth of Nations, he deals with the question of what one might do about this. And remember, he was writing at a time when most of those people engaged in the division of labor would not have had basic schooling. So they were illiterate and innumerate. And what he recommends as a partial solution to this problem of mental dulling is the institution of universal primary education. So everybody would be able to uh, read and write and calculate. Now, that's something that we take for granted. It seems like the natural way of the world. But in the 18th century, it was actually a very radical suggestion. And it was a suggestion that Smith thought should be implemented in good part by government. So he thought that there was an important role for government in counteracting some of these negative mental and cultural effects of the very processes of capitalist productivity that he praised elsewhere in the book. After your Adam Smith book, you published what, in my opinion, is a superb intellectual history um, of thought about capitalism in the West called The Mind and the Market. And I want to ask you what you think you bring to our thinking about capitalism and morality that maybe you know some of the other disciplines like economics or political science might miss. One of the heroes, as it were, of the mind in the market is Matthew Arnold, uh, who was a British poet and uh, cultural critic in the 1860s and 1870s. And he said that one of the purposes of liberal education is to take the best that's been thought and said in the world uh, in order to cast a fresh, a fresh stream of thought on our current concerns. And really, I would say that's the larger purpose of the mind in the market, to, uh, to rediscover uh, the lines of thought, the lines of analysis, the concerns of past intellectuals from across the political spectrum and people who either weren't part of any particular discipline or who were in one or another discipline and see the kinds of issues that they raise about the market and enterprise and business and its larger context and its larger political and moral and cultural ramifications. And one of the advantages of that is that for all the uh, advantages that disciplinary uh, research brings with it. It does tend to lead to a certain narrowing of the kinds of questions that one asks, depending in part on the methods that one has available to answer them. And one of the advantages of uh, a book like The Mind and the Market, I think, is that it reminds us of the range of questions that can and should be asked about a capitalist society, about the market, uh, about business, uh, and it shows us that that has ramifications for everything from uh, the nature of the family to the nature of identity to the extent to which individuals are able to uh, develop themselves as distinct people with their own sets of with their own sense of interests and the way in which they can use the market for that purpose. Mm -hmm. So, in short, I think the book uh, by uh, drawing on the thought of these major thinkers of the past uh, can ask us to can lead us to fresh perspectives, fresh questions, and occasionally fresh answers. So we live in a world now that is overwhelmingly capitalist. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's your sense that um, academics are losing sight of some of the big issues, the big questions about our capitalist world. 
I would say that when it comes to thinking about the world of business and enterprise, uh, many academics have a kind of built-in professional deformation. What do I mean by that? Well, a lot of business and enterprise has to do with entrepreneurship in one way or another. And entrepreneurs are almost by definition people who are comfortable with and oriented towards risk. And academics, almost by definition, are people who are risk averse. After all, what is the holy grail for academics? It's tenure. And there are a lot of advantages to tenure, and part of the advantage of tenure is that it reduces risks in life. But entrepreneurs are, almost by definition, a rather different sort of person. And so they're difficult, I think, for uh, academics to understand. Mm -hmm. uh, and in addition to that, it's hard for academics to understand the degree of uh, responsibility that comes from being an entrepreneur or heading a business where a lot where your own money is on the line or, and or a lot of people's jobs are on the line. Uh, and that creates a different set of uh, psychic pressures and different expectations of rewards than academics typically have. So for all of those reasons, I think many academics, perhaps sometimes even those in business schools, have problems coming to terms with the nature of entrepreneurship. Did you find in writing The Mind in the Market that the big questions, the big struggles, the debates about capitalism have been around for a long time and we maybe have a little amnesia? Or has there been a real evolution in the terms of the debate? I'm the kind of intellectual historian who believes in the importance of historical context. So if you want to understand what a particular thinker said about the market, you have to understand what actually did capitalism mean in his day, because it meant something very different at different stages of, uh, of modern history. Mm -hmm. And so uh, it's important to see what in particular they were talking about. And so some of the questions do, do change over time. For example, one of the most uh, important recent questions is what are the ramifications of the transformation from a industrial economy to a knowledge economy? And what are the ramifications of an economy in which women play a much larger role in paid work, in part because of the changed nature of work in a knowledge-based society as opposed to a more industrial society? So those are the sorts of dynamic elements of capitalism that lead you to ask somewhat different questions mm -hmm. at, as well as perhaps giving different answers at different stages. Do you see some limitations in the way most academic disciplines try to understand capitalism? One of the greatest difficulties is actually getting a handle on the sources of capitalist dynamism. Uh, Joseph Schumpeter, one of my uh, intellectual exemplars was very interested in the questions of entrepreneurship and economic dynamism and he pointed out that a lot of economics at the time and one might say a lot of economics to this day is not very good at thinking about what it is that makes capitalism dynamic and indeed in many ways that's one of the most important things to understand about capitalism as for example Marx and Engels did in the Communist Manifesto the fact that it's constantly revolutionizing the means of production so the, that's uh, how to get at that is difficult because it's something that you can't measure uh, through statistics through mathematical models a lot of it has to do with uh, the personality of entrepreneurs uh, the psychological characteristics of people who innovate, uh, the way in which organizations either promote that kind of innovation or retard it. And those are all uh, issues that uh, some academics are interested in, but they tend to be on the margins of academic disciplines. And it's the kind of thing where you can't give a precise uh, scientific answer.